If you want to preserve your own meat, or if you find jerky absolutely delicious but expensive in the shops, then stick around. Today we're going to show you how to make jerky and how to make it so that it's safe, delicious and cheap. Hello, welcome to English Country Life. Welcome to the kitchen. Welcome to jerky making. My name's Hugh, and today I want to go over with you how I make delicious, really well-priced, absolutely wonderful jerky. Now, when I say jerky, I'm basically talking about dried meat. And the meat is dried, it was dried originally as a preservation process. If you dry a food out completely, be it a vegetable, be it a meat, be it a fruit, what you do is remove the moisture that's necessary for bacterial action, and that acts as a preservation technique. And when I say jerky, I really am just talking about dried meat, and different countries dry meat, and they use slightly different techniques. So for example, in South Africa, they have a product called biltong. Now biltong tends to be dried in one large lump that you then cut pieces off. Jerky tends to be pre-sliced and then dried. But ultimately, the preservation is the same. Now I want to go over this in several steps. I want to talk about the meat itself, which meats we should use, which meats we might choose to avoid. I am going to marinate my jerky, infuse it with wonderful flavours. And then we're going to dry it and we're going to look at some different techniques for doing that. So we'll do that in those three steps. But first things first, let's look at our meat. This is the meat that we're going to use. This is a loin of venison. Wonderful cut of meat. Many people would say too good for using for jerky. But you know what? If you're going to make a good product, use good cuts of meat. We are very lucky in that we didn't pay butcher price for our venison. A great guy called Dan recently arranged for us to get an entire fallow carcass that we butchered ourselves. And that, of course, saved us a great deal of money. Now, there are more deer alive in Britain today than there were at the time of William the Conqueror. And because there are no apex predators, the numbers do need to be managed. So actually, wild venison is a wonderful, sustainable food. And if you can get hold of venison carcasses and learn how to butcher them yourselves, you can get wonderful meat for a very, very reasonable price. So to prepare this for jerky, the first thing I want to do, you may just see some little white lines here, and that's what's called silver skin, and that's connective tissue in the meat, but that doesn't dry very well. So what I am going to do is just trim out any little bits of silver skin that I missed in the original butchery process, just to make sure that the finished product is absolutely wonderful. And whilst I'm doing that, it's probably worth spending a moment or two just discussing what kind of meats are suitable for jerky making. And the preservation is drying, and that bears on what's the right kind of meat to use. Because you're drying the meat, it generally will not get up to a high temperature, and some meats need to be cooked at a high temperature to make them safe. So I'm thinking there particularly about things like pork. Traditionally, beef and venison are the kind of meats you would use for making jerky. You can certainly do it with fish. If you think about fish, sushi, you know, is uncooked fish and that's safe to eat. But foods that are not safe to eat raw, you want to be very careful about making jerky with, and certainly you need to cook them for a while at high temperature first to render them safe. But personally, I would go with beef or venison. It's time to slice our venison into our jerky pieces, and there's a technique that I'd really want to show you. This loin runs along the back, along the spine of the deer, and the fibres in the meat run this way. If you ever look at meat up close, particularly steaks and things, you'll find it has lines in it, which are the fibres, the muscle fibres of the meat, like the grain in wood. And if you slice along those fibres, you end up with something that's almost like a stick of celery. It's got long fibres that have to be pulled apart to eat it. Whereas if you cut across those fibres, when you're eating it, it will come apart beautifully in your mouth. So we're going to cut our venison into thin strips. What I mean by thin, 
no more than quarter of an inch certainly you know a few millimeters thick no more than that we want it thin that's the sort of thickness that i'm looking for you can do this on a bacon slicer we have one but i prefer to hand cut and watch what i'm doing but honestly it is hard to slice it too thin if you're not sure go thinner there we go that's a venison loin thinly sliced now we're going to talk about marinades now marinade is not the same thing as a cure on bacon a cure on bacon is integral to the preserving process Marinade just adds flavour, but I think it makes a jerky so, so much better. So we're going to marinate our jerky. You don't have to. If you want to do it plain, that's absolutely fine. But I'm going to marinate it. I would encourage you to make up your own marinades with flavours that you love. But I think there are some principles that are useful. I find that dishes that work well have contrasting flavours. Think about salt and vinegar. Think about lamb and red currant jelly, sweet and sour sauce, contrasting flavours that really, really work. They hit different areas of your tongue. And I make my marinades based on the four S's. And what are those? Well, they want something sweet. And I think that adds and contrasts the meat. Sweet meat sounds odd, but think about it differently. Think about turkey and cranberry. Think about lamb and red currant jelly. All those kind of things, sausage rolls and chutney. Something sweet really, really works with meat. So sweet and then salt. Doesn't have to be white granular table salt, but something with a salty kind of flavor. That could be salt, that could be soy sauce, that could be Worcester sauce, that could be any of those kind of things. Worcester sauce, by the way, actually comes from anchovies. Um, and it, that's what gives it its salty flavor. And so, you know what? fish sauce that would work that would give it that salty bite so we've got sweet we've got salt i think sour helps i usually add some kind of like lime juice or lemon juice or something like that partly because it gives it that lightness that zing but also that acidity when it marinates the meat helps soften and break down the meat last thing then spices i think you need some spices don't just be dull and go for chili. Of course, chili flavored, you know, jerky is absolutely wonderful. But there's so much else. You could you go with a barbecue flavor. I like using sweet paprika because that gives some of those barbecue notes. So that is all good. And I definitely think that a lot of the time, some kind of fruit has a role to play in jerky making. So I'm gonna mix up a marinade and we're gonna marinate our meat. Let's see how I do it. And then you can use that and adapt it and change it and make it right for you. This is gonna be the basis of my marinade. Because I'm using venison, I think some of our sour fruits go well with it. That can be something like this. This is red currants that we grew in the garden. And I'm gonna break them up because what we want, we don't want a coating with our marinade. We really want it to go in and penetrate that meat. Now these have been frozen and defrosted, hence why they're all sort of squishy and runny and lovely. And that's really gonna help them again, get that wonderful fruity sour flavor into the meat. I've got about 150 grams there of red currants. And to that, I'm gonna add a couple of tablespoons of raw cane sugar to give that sweetness that we talked about. The thing with raw cane sugar is it tends to stick together. So I'm using a fork to sort of mash it into the red currants. Now, again, as I said earlier, you don't have to use red currants. But I do think red currant goes well with game. But so would blackberry. So would cranberry. Be absolutely lovely. So part of this is about what do you grow, what do you have. On top of our sugar and fruit, 
I'm going to use Worcester sauce. Good few shakes of Worcester sauce to give it that salty little kick. Let's start on the spices. I like a sort of almost like a barbecuey taste, so a bit of paprika I think is wonderful. On top of that, I want some onion to give it some sort of depth of flavour. So I'm going to use dried onion powder that we've prepared. And I'm going to put about three teaspoons of dried onion powder in. Lastly, I'm going to put a few grinds of fresh black pepper. And we give all that a stir. I am going to add some chilli to this recipe, but I'm not going to put in chilli flakes, chilli powder, or even chopped fresh or frozen chilies. I'm going to use our own fermented hot sauce. This one we make from the wonderful citrusy lemon aji chilli, and I'm putting a teaspoon of that in. I'm also going to add a teaspoon of this hot sauce that we make, and this one we make from hotter chilies. The lemon aji is actually very mild, but gives some lovely flavour depth. That's going to give just a little bit of heat in our marinade. Well, we've got two bowls now. One with our meat slices, one with our marinade. I'm going to combine them together into a plastic box that I can leave in the fridge with a lid on for 24 to 48 hours to really let those flavours infuse. And when we put them together, I am literally going to massage this marinade into the meat to drive it into those meat fibres. So it's not just a coating, it really flavours the meat. There we are. That's our venison and marinade, and I'm gonna leave that in the fridge for the flavors to develop and infuse for 24 to 48 hours. The amount of meat involved here is 650 grams. For the good and sufficient reason, that's what the loin of venison that we cut off actually weighed. But I'm gonna put the recipe down below in the description. And if you assume that that recipe is good for 500 grams, of meat or a pound of meat if you use imperial it'll stretch a little bit further if like us you've got a slightly larger cut of meat and of course scale it up to do more well our jerky's finished marinating smells and looks wonderful now we have to dry it and the key word is dry not cook so the temperature we're looking to do this at for jerky is round about 65 to 70 centigrade. Say about 155, 160 Fahrenheit. And we want to over time just take the moisture out. We don't want to cook it. That's not what jerky is all about. Now the way that we normally do this is in a dehydrator because we've got one. If you're going to dry a lot of food and we dry masses of fruit, a lot of vegetables, we make things like onion powder and tomato powder. We make our own spices and chilli and all that kind of thing. And it's well worth it if you produce a lot of food. But not everyone has one. So I am also going to show how you can make your own jerky in an oven. But first up, let's put a lot of our jerky into the dehydrator. We'll set it going. How long it takes to dry is a bit of a movable feast. Because obviously, subject to what kind of meat you're using, subject to the type of your dehydrator, subject to the thickness that you've sliced your jerky, it all varies. Even background temperature and humidity makes a huge difference. As a rule of thumb, it can be anything between 8 and 24 hours, depending on how you're doing it. But I would say probably take your first look about 6 hours, and we'll show you later how to tell when your jerky's done. What I am doing is taking great pains to make sure that each slice of jerky isn't sitting curled up, but is lying completely flat on the dehydrator tray because I want this stuff to dry evenly. I don't want wet spots inside, inside the curled up part where the rest of it is dry because if I carry on drying it then the outside will be too hard, the inside will be too soft and it's not an even process. So getting it as flat as possible is a really good idea. With 
jerky inside, you close up the dehydrator, set the temperature, set the timer, and turn it on. I've turned the dehydrator off just for a second so you can hear me talk. I'm going to show you now the technique of drying jerky in an oven, and it can be a little bit tricky. Now, there is a magical technique, which I'm going to show you first, and it uses this high-tech gadget called a cocktail stick. And what we're going to do is take one cocktail stick per piece of jerky, poke it through the jerky, and then hang the jerky below the metal bars of the oven shelf. And that keeps the jerky separated, lets the air circulate around it, seems to work as well as anything I've ever seen. I didn't invent the technique, I saw someone else do it. I thought that's really, really clever. The setting that we need to get our oven at, the temperature, needs to be 65 to 70 centigrade, and that can be a problem for modern ovens. Now, I'm gonna show you this technique in our wood burning range, our SE iron heart. And I'm gonna do that because we've got it lit at this time of year. And if I keep the fire very small, I can keep the temperature down to that kind of range, but it can be tricky to know. So I use, an oven thermometer, a little metal hanging oven thermometer that tells me what temperature the oven's at. And again, if you can do this a lot in your oven, I would suggest investing in something like that. What I can tell you from experience is doing it in a conventional oven isn't as quick as doing it in a dehydrator. And I'm fairly convinced the reason for that is our dehydrators have fans and that blows the moisture away from the meat as it evaporates. Whereas in the oven, it can tend to get a little bit sort of moist inside the oven and that inhibits the meat giving up more moisture. Now, if you've got a fan oven, you're probably gonna find your oven is more efficient than ours if you can get it down to the right temperature. If you can't, just crack the oven door a little bit. That's gonna serve two purposes. One, it lets that moisture out. Two, lets a bit of heat out, get your temperature down to where you need it. Let's go and take a look at that technique. This is our SE iron heart. You can see I've got a very small fire in the firebox, just a pile of embers and a very small log on it. And this is the oven. So let's have a look at that technique for doing jerky in a cool oven. First things first, I'm going to put a drip tray in the bottom of the oven because this jerky will drip. Now you can see here I've got a little oven thermometer letting me know that the oven is at roughly the right temperature. If anything with a wood burning oven you want it a little bit higher because it will lose some temperature as we set it up and then it will regain that temperature when we close it. Once it's there we let the fire die right down and just keep it ticking over. What do we do? Well there's the oven and we take each piece of jerky on its cocktail stick and we hang it like that through the bars of the oven and we'll let that dry with plenty of airspace around it. I think you can see how the technique works. Meat through the bars, cocktail stick across the bars, meat hanging down below. And you can see, I think, that you can get a lot of jerky in a relatively small oven, several kilos, certainly. You don't have to use cocktail sticks if you don't have them. You could use a metal skewer all the way across to do a whole row. You could use a piece of fence wire. You could put some fine metal mesh on your shelf and lay the jerky flat. Just use your imagination. And it's done. Six and a half hours in the dehydrator. Look how slim that is now. Took a little bit longer in the oven, about seven and a half, seven and three quarter hours. Come in close and have a look. Let's take a look then at this jerky. I think the first thing to notice is it's stiff, it's hard. Now you can dry jerky to different levels of hardness, but when you slice it thin like this, if you dry it very hard, it will last a good long time. The drier you get it, the longer it will last. It's lost most of its thickness. It may start off at three or four millimeters, ends up around a millimeter. Starts at a quarter of an inch, ends up at maybe a sixteenth. And people think that will make it hard to eat, but look, it just snaps easily. And as you chew it, it just rehydrates. It's absolutely delicious because we sliced it across the grain of the meat. 
And you can also see that that marinade, those little pieces of red currant, etc., have adhered to the surface of the meat, gives it that wonderful fruity flavour. That's our wild venison jerky. Let's have a go at how it tastes. It crumbles in the mouth because we cut across the grains. It's got a sweetness, but that slightly acid tang from the red currants. And I think those sharper fruit really suit game meat. The chili is there, although to be honest, if I was to do it again, I'd add a little bit more chili for my taste. And there's that lovely warm roundness of the Worcester sauce. Overall, absolutely delicious. Will last if you put it in an airtight jar or vacuum packet for many, many months. Brilliant as a trail snack, great with a glass of beer. Just a nice, healthy, lean, protein-rich all-round snack. I hope you've enjoyed that video, and if you have, could you spare us five seconds and give us a thumbs up down below. Would you like to see more of what we do with some of the wild meat that we take? At the moment, for example, we're making venison bacon, which is much requested on the channel, and we're going to do a video on that, but we could do a lot more on these sort of food preservation type techniques. And if you'd like to see them, hit on that subscribe button, hit the bell next to it, and tell us in the comments what you're interested in seeing, and we'll make sure and make those kind of videos. But whatever you do, Come back and see us soon. Take care.